Um, in fact, I like to talk about compensation and feedback. We started on that last night. Um, a review from the last lecture. Um, we um, analyzed the structure by inspection, and we were able to find the DC gain, uh, the gain bandwidth product, and the two poles. Um, minor problem, there might be some zeros present, and the analysis method that we looked at misses the zeros. Um, if they exist. So let's go back and try to get a handle on the zeros. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do an analysis with the intention of characterizing this circuit on the screen here. But last time we talked about the fact that we have lots of choices for each of these amplifiers. This could be a common source quarter circuit, a cascode, telescopic cascode. We have a lot of different options for this first stage, a lot of options for the second stage. So I'm going to try to do an analysis that applies for any architecture um, and then apply it to the structure here. So, and I'm going to do a differential small signal analysis. Eventually, we're going to come back and get the common mode uh, analysis, but right now it's a differential small signal analysis. Um, so, this is the small signal equivalent circuit of that differential stage. There's a slight error here. What's the slight error that I've introduced here? So I guess there's I guess there's no errors yet. Um, it's not quite symmetric. So, so yeah, there's a slight error. So, so what's the slight error that I've introduced here? Tim. Uh, well, you don't have M7 in there, but that's okay because it's grounded on either side of it, right? It, um, actually, that's, that's where there's come from. Uh, I was going to say, is it like okay to make the assumption that V is divided by 2 if it's not symmetrical? That's still valid for the differential gain. That part's still good. Here? You assume the source node on M1 and M2 is 0? I assume the source node on M1 and M2 is 0. And it's slightly different than 0. And if you include that slight dependence um, on that node, you're going to have a solution to this that looks like that MATLAB solution I gave you before. Okay, So I've, I've made one assumption here that's, that's not going to introduce, introduce any significant error at all, but it induces a, a very, very slight error, not significant. Make sense? Outside of that, it's, um, um, it's general. And of course, that's a general model of the second stage. Yet. And then the compensation capacitor goes um, around the second stage from the output to the input. By the way, when you have a structure where you connect a capacitor across a high gain inverting stage, what does that do at the input? It creates what? What? High value capacitor. We have a special name for that capacitor you create Miller, Miller capacitance. So this structure creates a, a Miller capacitance, fairly big Miller capacitance on the output node of the first stage. And when I refer to capacitors on nodes after discussions last night, does that all make sense? There actually physically are a lot of capacitors already on a node, so we just refer to um, any capacitance from that node to, to ground as a, a capacitance on that node. We also refer to poles on that node. Poles are in on our nodes, but we refer to the pole that corresponding to that capacitor as the pole on that node. So, the small signal equivalent for this structure here can be obtained by putting in the small signal model for the four transistors. And I can sum currents at two nodes. 
this node and this node, and I can get the relationship between Bx and Ix and the excitation. And if I look at these two equations and um, eliminate the intermediate node voltage V4, I get this expression right here. And this equation here describes the port characteristics of this input circuit as I see from this output port. Ix is equal to Vx times G out 2 plus G out 4 plus Gm2 times Vd. And I, all I've done to get this is I've neglected the G outs compared to G in here. But my goal was to make this a general analysis. So this is the relationship for this differential stage. But this is the form. Ix is equal to Vx times something plus something else times Vd. <coughs> so I can model the input stage with this circuit here, um, where if, if I look at Vx, I can say Vx is equal to, to Vx G out D, that's this current here, plus this current here, GMD VD, that's equal to Ix. So I put the subscripts D on here to indicate this is the differential input stage. This is GMD, and this is G out D. No matter what architecture I have here, I can always model it like this. So it's characterized by two parameters, GMD and, 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 and G out D. Does that make sense? And for this particular circuit, G out D is G out 2 plus G out 4, and GMD is GM2. So with the telescopic cascode structure, it's still characterized by the two parameters, G M D and G out D. But we have a different expression for G out D and a different expression for G M D. This is a pretty simple model at that first stage, isn't it? Yes? Do we not have to include the input or is that taken care of the ah. The input is right here. <clears throat> Remember, this is a differential, differential input analysis. How about the second stage? Second stage is a two-port. Well, I could think of the first stage as a two-port too, but I absorbed that VD into, into, that, into that circuit. Put in the two transistors. Um, I'm going to define G00, the output connection to the output stage, and GM0, the GM of the output stage, and um, you can show that this two-port model is equivalent to, this two-port number is equivalent to this. So this is GM0, and this is G out 0. Remember, GM0 was given as a function of the parameters of M5 and M6, and G00 as a function of those parameters. But I could put any second stage in. I could have a cascode stage, a gain boosted cascode, and so forth. It will still be in this form. The only difference will be the values for these parameters might be different. They're determined by the second stage parameters. So how many parameters are now characterizing this op-amp, this two-stage op-amp? Four. GMD, G out D of the first stage, GOO and GMO for this output stage, or the second stage, four parameters. 
So now if I want to analyze the circuit, instead of going back in and putting the small signal models in for these devices, I can put in the equivalent circuits for those first stage and the second stage, put my compensation capacitor on, put my load capacitor on, and this is a small signal equivalent model for this amplifier or any other amplifier that's a two-stage structure as well. Okay. Francisco, why are we doing this? Why are we why are we making a mapping to this to these other these other blocks here? That's not the complete reason. Not it's not simplified. I haven't simplified it. Yeah, so I'm going to get the zeros. If there's zeros here, I'm going to get them. The major reason I'm doing it is I want to have one analysis that applies for any architecture that's two stage. Furthermore, it's going to take less time this way. If you go back and put in the small signal models for, for um, those six transistors, you've got a complicated circuit, right? I've got a simple circuit, and this solution applies for, for any structure. So let's analyze it. I can sum currents with this node. Now, when I point an equation, say I can sum currents against this equation. Do I need to go through it, or, or if I just say we can do it, is that good enough? Everybody's comfortable with I say how we get it, right? Okay. So I sum currents with this node, I get this equation. I sum currents with this node, I get this equation. And I have one extra unknown in these equations. I want to let obtain the relation between V out and VD. There's one extra unknown here, that's V2. So I can eliminate V2 between these two equations. And I get the I, I get the gain. V out is equal to VD. Uh, oh. What happened here? We missed something last night. We knew we missed it, it was there. And it was there. What did we miss? The zeros. zeros. Our previous analysis, we will show shortly, um, gets the poles. We can look at the poles of this, and we know how to get those. We got those last night. But we missed the zero. Okay? So we found the zero. This simplifies... Uh, since the output conductances are typically small compared to the transconductances. Um, um, and since C sub C is usually going to be big because we're dominant pole compensated, um, this G out D times CL then should be small compared to this term. So I can neglect this and I can neglect this and I'm just left with GM zero C sub C um, and this term and and the product of the output conductance of the two stages, the first stage and the second stage. So here's a summary. Now I'm going to go back in and plug in the characteristics of this particular two stage op amp. And we saw that GMD was equal to GM1, and GM1 and GM2 were the same. We saw G out at the differential stage, the first stage, was G out 2 plus G out 4, and we saw G out out was uh, G out 5 plus G out 6. So I can plug these back in if I want to, and I'll have it now in terms of the characteristics of this particular two-stage op amp. If I had a telescopic cascode first stage, what would I do? The same expression, but I just have different values for GMD, GIB, and GIB, right? Substitute them in here. So this has two negative real axis poles, P1 and P2, and it has a right half plane zero. So I'm going to compare two structures now. This structure we just analyzed. 
It has this right half plane zero. We looked at this structure last night. We didn't know if it had a zero or not either, the way we analyzed it. But you can show that there is no zero in this structure. And so this is what it looks like. And all we've done is taken this capacitor and move it from, from here down to here. And it doesn't have that right half plane zero. Denominator expressions are different too. Um, This term is different here than it is here. Now, with this structure, we know how to compensate. We want the pole ratio, and we can we can write down close from expression of the pole. We'll talk about a way to pick out the poles by inspection. Do we do we like to solve the quadratic equation? No. Why don't we like to solve the quadratic equation? It can be tough. It can be tough. Tough in the sense you've got a lot of a pencil strokes. Because the, the solution, trivial, it's a trivial solution, right? Minus b plus minus squared, b squared minus 4ac over 2a. But it takes a half a page of paper to write it down. Okay? So we'll talk about how to solve that, that quadratic equation in a simpler way. Um, so we want to have the pole ratio between here and here. Why do we want to put the pole ratio between here and here? To keep it yeah. between the angle of 45, 45 and, 90. and 90. And why do we want to do that? It's what? I didn't hear that word. No, I didn't say that. To prevent peaking and ring. What? To prevent peaking and ring. To prevent peaking and ring. Yeah. Is that not stable? <laughs> it's it's like, it's yeah, it's stable. It's, it's, it's stable, but if you think of being stable, you're thinking about problems. If you think about preventing ringing and overshoot, you're thinking about good performance. Oh, so If you're close, the, the, the reason I don't like to talk about stability if you're anywhere near becoming unstable, you've got a bad circuit, right? So the answer was correct. What we're putting it there is to control the overshoot and the ringing to an acceptable level. Not even close to being unstable. But how about what's going on here? This derivation was based on the assumption that we had an all-pole transfer function. We no longer have an all-pole transfer function. So this assumption, the assumptions we made to get this, this pole ratio are no longer valid. Let's consider second-order polynomial. It's interesting when you look at the second-order polynomial, s squared plus a1s plus a0, that depending on which course you're in and which discipline you're in, people look at that a different way. That polynomial on top here is characterized, if I write an intergermonic form, that is the coefficient of s squared is 1, is characterized by two parameters, a0 and, and a1, right? The controls people like to write it this way, and the filters people. It's characterized by the parameters uh, oh, again. Make it out in Q. In your differential equation, in your differential equations class, it likes to write it like this: s squared plus um, two s z. Um, it shouldn't be twice plus omega naught squared. In this case, it's characterized by the parameters z and omega naught. Some people like to write it in this form. It's characterized by the parameters. P1 and P2. If they're complex conjugate poles, it's written in this form. It's characterized by the parameters alpha and beta. Well, we have one, two, three, four, five different characterizations of the second-order polynomial in terms of five different parameter domains, same function. 
Do we need so many different characterizations? Not really. Um, but we've got to be able to converse with people in different environments, so we might as well talk about them. So let's look at Omega Naught and Q. Um, so I've write it in this form. Omega Naught is the distance from the origin in the complex plane to the pole. And the angle theta that the pole makes with the measuring axis um, satisfies the relationship the sine of theta is equal to 1 over 2Q. So in this form, Q is a direct measure of the angle and omega naught is a direct measure of the magnitude. I kind of like this form because we saw for compensation we want to control that angle. So the Q is a good parameter to use if we're going to control the angle of that pole. And it's when that angle gets less than 45 degrees that you start having problems with either ring or overshoot. Make sense? Now, you can show that Q of 0.5 corresponds to two identical real axis poles. So when Q is 0.5, it will fold down as the angle will be 90 degrees. And when Q is equal to 0 0.707, it's a 45 degrees. So if we want to do compensation, I haven't used that, that, that phase word yet. If you want to do compensation, we could say we would like to have the Q be between what? 0.5 and 0.75. So we looked at the ratio before uh, when we had an all pole system. Now, if you, if you got zeros present, you still want to be sure that those poles are between 45 and 90. So we still want to have the Q between 0.5 and 0 0.707. Is this a high Q or low Q requirement? It's pretty low Q. Pretty low Q. If Q is less than 0.5, you have, ne you have two negative real axis poles. Will we make our compensation better if we make Q of, say, 0.1? No. Nope. Because what's going to happen? <clears throat> those poles will come together and split. And one starts to move into lower frequency. And we said if you put them down the real axis and make them split, you won't have ringing and you won't have overshoot, but you're either going to have too much capacitance or too much power for a given bandwidth. Make sense? So do you want to compensate the structure to have Q of 0.1? Probably not. This is a very big window that we've got to compensate it for. Not really. From 0.5 to 0 0.707. Now I'm going to try to get rid of the quadratic equation. If you build an amplifier, it's very useful. Even if there's a zero present, you're probably going to want to have some separation of the poles. You're probably going to have a dominant pole and a non-dominant pole. So I'm going to assume that P1 and P2 are the poles, and P1 is much, much less than P2. So I can write that character's equation in factor form, and that's S squared plus S times P1 plus P2 plus P1, P2. But I'm assuming that P1 is much less than P2. So I can eliminate the P1 there, and this is probably S squared plus P2S plus P1, P2. Okay. Now I'm not going to eliminate the quadratic equation in general. I'm going to look at limiting using the quadratic equation when we have widely separated poles. Because we're interested in situations where we have widely separated poles.
So if I look at these two terms here, if I set that equal to zero, those last two, the sum of those last two terms, the P2 is canceled, and I get P1. And if I look at the first two terms, an S cancels, and I get P2. So I could read off by inspection P1 and P2 from a second order polynomial um, when the poles are widely separated. Thus, if you go back to this expression here, um, P2 is equal to minus 1 over 1. And P1 is equal to minus A0 over A1. Okay. Any questions so far? So, here was the um, gain expression of the open loop um, Miller compensated um, operational amplifier. So those, this term here will give me what? High frequency pole? No, I don't need to do this because we found it last night. But let's see what we get. Um, P2 is going to, the CCs cancel, and it's simply GM5 over CL, or the negative of that. And P1 is equal to the negative of GOO, GOD over GM5CC. The DC gain is GMD, GM5 over GOO, GOD. The gain bandwidth product, assuming that the zero is reasonably high in frequency, is um, equal to um, the product of the gain in P1. So you take the product of, of the gain in P1, and the GOO, GODs cancel, and we're left with, with um, GMD over CCC. <coughs> For the P previous inspection, we had written down P1 and P2. We did this in the last lecture. I looked at the poles on those two notes. Um, and we found that GB was equal to GM1 over C sub C. If you look at the expressions for GOO, GOD, um, GMD, and, and GM, you find that those expressions are the same that we had last, whoops. Those expressions we had for the poles are the same ones we had last night. So it's at least reassuring that we found the right poles. Now let's look what happens with feedback. Why do you want to look at feedback? Yeah, we want to compensate it now. We know we're going to have to compensate it. We have to find out how big C sub C is. And it only becomes relevant once we put in a feedback loop. So let's go to the feedback. How should the amplifier be compensated? Well, the open loop gain um, is the ratio of two polynomials, N of S and D of S, we've got those first two stage job at now. And I'm going to assume there's a standard feedback gain of the form A over 1 plus A beta. And we certainly saw one circuit that had those properties last time. The, the circuit that, that um, this circuit here.
right? We saw that satisfied the basic A over 1 plus A basic equation. If you put the input here, it doesn't. But if you put it in here, it does. But remember um, that um, the poles of both are the same. So if I put the poles in the right place for this circuit, I will also have the poles in the right place for the other circuit. If you look at the game with feedback, put in N of S over D of S, um, and then um, into this expression for A of S, N of S over D of S, you multiply through by D of S, and this is a game with feedback. So we see that the numerator with feedback is the same as the numerator without feedback. That means the zeros with feedback are the same as the zeros in the old loop amplifier. But the denominator polynomial is equal to the sum of what we had for the old loop amplifier plus beta times the numerator. That was true whether or not we have a zero in the numerator. We still had that beta times the numerator present there. The closed loop poles are different, generally dramatically different than the open loop poles. Um, and oftentimes beta, I, I put beta of s in there. You can use any compensation network you want. There could be capacitors or inductors of beta if you want, but oftentimes beta is frequency independent. Oftentimes beta is just made with resistors or just with capacitors, not with both. So this is the, what I call the ultimate feedback gain equation. And that's what you get if you put the input here and ground this terminal. So the basic inverted configuration. Okay, this is no feedback amplifier. But it does not satisfy the A over 1 plus A beta equation. If the input's a voltage and the output's a voltage. We can redraw this circuit. This is actually a trans-resistance amplifier. If we draw it as a trans-resistance amplifier, you can show that the output voltage over the input current satisfies the expression A over 1 plus A beta. But as a voltage amplifier, it's still a feedback amplifier, but it's not of the form A over 1 plus A beta. It's of the form um, 1 over beta 1 divided by 1 plus 1 over beta A of S. Beta is beta of the network. Beta 1 is another quantity that in this case is different than beta. And if I multiply out by, um, put in NS over D of S, the game with feedback looks like this. Look at this expression. The denominator is the same as we had before, which we expect, because the poles are independent of where you apply the excitation, where you take the response. The new is different in this case for this different architecture. Okay. If beta and beta 1 are not dependent upon frequency, then beta over beta 1 is a real number, and the zeros of the structure will be the same um, as if you put the input on the plus terminal. But if betas are frequency dependent, the zeros might be different here. So now we had the gain with feedback. We calculated the gain with feedback for that structure. And we plug in N of S and D of S. N of S stays the same as we had before. 
and d of s gets modified, plug back into that expression that we had for the gain of feedback. So that was d of s plus beta a of s, and we get this denominator expression. Um, and these were the same expressions we had for GMD and GOD and GMO and GMO at um, the beginning of the lecture. So how has this changed? That zero in the numerator of the old loop amplifier changed this expression by adding this term here in the denominator. That term was absent before. Now when we have that zero present in the open loop gain, it introduces a change in this S coefficient in the denominator. So what's happened to the Q of this structure. Let's assume that all the components were the same as before. What's happened to the Q here? If you look at that second order polynomial, S squared plus A1S plus A0. If these two terms are the same and this term is the same, how does Q relate to A1? Yes, that's right. So as A1 gets smaller, Q gets bigger. As A1 gets smaller, Q gets bigger. As that coefficient of the S term gets smaller, Q gets bigger. Where do the poles move then? Because of that zero. Closer to the imaginary axis. The angle becomes much shallower. Is that good or bad? That's bad. Okay, so this right half plane zero that came along for free has degraded the performance of the structure. But we can take care of that because all we're really concerned about is the magnitude of this term here. So if this part becomes smaller, the way to take care of it is to do what? Make this bigger, right? Is that a good solution? No. no, we don't like to make CC bigger because that affects other things in the circuit in addition to area. Okay, so... In this case, I, I did what I said I didn't want to do. And I actually solved that quadratic equation. And, and I can solve the quadratic equation and get the expression for Q. <coughs> and this expression for Q. But this expression is beautiful. Because if we compensate the circuit, we have to determine what? <coughs> C sub C. I have a closed form expression for C sub C. But do you know your beta? What? Yeah, by your application. Beta is whatever you need for your application. But at the catalog part, beta will usually be one. one. Not necessarily good, you pay a penalty for that, but beta will usually be one, right? Okay. How about Q? What's Q? Jane. What's Q? This what? We did approximation under the assumption that widely separated poles. That was with the open loop amplifier. They're no longer widely separated as closed loop amplifier. So our approximate way to factor that second order polynomial no longer applies for the closed loop circuit. Open loop circuit, the poles are widely separated, right? So we could write down by inspection the op open loop poles and, and the Q and so forth. But this is a, a situation where the poles are not widely separated. 
What's Q? Q yeah, it's what you want it to be. So what, what will you pick Q? Between 0.5 and 0.75. You might pick it to be 0.6. So now you know the glowing capacitance, you know beta, pick the Q that you want. You know your GMs, you know your, your, your beta, and just solve this equation, you've got sub C sub C. Make sense? So now we've got ways to compensate if you just have a single capacitor to ground, and we know how to compensate the circuit if we use the Miller capacitance. Okay, Q should be 0.5 and 0.7. The right half plane zero in the open loop gain has hurt us. It's due to this term that we added here. That came from that right half plane zero. So what do you think we're going to come back to do and talk about next time? How to what? How to fix it. Can we do something with that right half plane zero? Um, and that may be, well, it'll require circuit modification. We'll come back and see if there's a way we can modify the circuit so that that right half plane zero doesn't hurt us. In fact, we're going to modify it in such a way that that right half plane zero becomes an asset, not a liability. Any questions? How many equations did I write today? One. One. Not too, not too many again, uh, as well.